A few weeks ago, a new version of the core specification, it's 3,000 pages, it defines how Bluetooth works, was released. You're actually the first audience I've had the opportunity to talk to about it, five, six weeks old now. Um, so I'm going to start off with topic number one, which is to just talk you through the things it contains. What are the main changes and kind of new capabilities that Bluetooth has as a consequence of this new specification version? And I'm going to press that button there. So just set the scene, first of all. I uh, don't know my audience too well today. Don't know what you do and don't know. We do now have three Bluetooth technologies. Basic rate, enhanced data rate on the left there. That's the first original version of Bluetooth. It's like a cable replacement technology, kind of one-to-one -one communication between two devices as if there's an invisible cable. It's 20 years old now, still going strong in areas like audio. Bluetooth Low Energy is about nine years old now, I think. Very different design goals, very power efficient, being really successful. In terms of topologies, yes, it can form connections between two devices, but it can also oper operate in a connectionless way, which means it can broadcast data and any other device in range can receive that data. So that's like one to many, where the, the many number can be very large. There's no limit to that, really. And then there's mesh, Bluetooth mesh, relatively new still, <coughs> excuse me, uh, which I'm going to talk about next. And that's about large networks of smart devices, largely designed with things like smart buildings in mind. So one of the things I like about Bluetooth, and I think the reason it's um, still with us 20 years and so many months on, last year was its official, um, I'm being given stage direction here to stand in the right place. Is the, okay, <laughs> I told you I'd move. Um, so last year was the official 20 year anniversary of Bluetooth. Um, so that's quite phenomenal because most technologies don't last that long. We get big paradigm shifts, things change. Some technologies, I like to say, never quite arrive. You know, lots of hype and they never quite arrive. Bluetooth is still here, I think, partly, perhaps largely because of a constant evolutionary process. So deliberately progressing the technology, thanks to our membership. So we're a membership organization, and it's the companies who are members of Bluetooth Special Interest Group, really, that drive that evolution. So every year, something changes, something new becomes possible. And the Bluetooth collection of technologies today is quite different to what we started with all those years ago. So most recently, um, three key milestones, Bluetooth 5 was released, not 5.0 for some reason, Bluetooth 5, right at the end of 2016. And that quadrupled the range, it doubled the, the speed to 2 megabits per second, and made some other um, changes around the, the kind of broadcast mode that, was, um, that it supports. That's Bluetooth Low Energy. 2017 in the summer, so just over a year ago now, Bluetooth Mesh arrived, entirely different technology based upon Bluetooth Low Energy. I'll come to that later on in detail. And then a few weeks ago, as I said, 5.1 arrived um, with a number of new features. They're there on the screen. The, the headline for me um, is direction finding. So I'm going to spend most of my time talking about that. It's quite a deep subject, actually. Um, I'm limited in how much I can tell you about it today, but I'll hopefully get you started. Um, and then some kind of lesser things, which may or may not be of interest to you, but I'll tell you what they are, at least you'll have that information coming out of today. Uh, the, the goal, don't forget, apparently, is to go home happy. I quite like that. Never heard that as a conference before, but that's my kind of objective, <laughs> like that. So let's talk about the direction finding stuff, but set the scene, first of all, by talking about location services. So I've been going to kind of technical conferences for decades, and I remember certainly well over 20 years ago, there were people talking about location-based services, not with Bluetooth, but it was a thing back then. It's when mobile was becoming a topic. It was before smartphones. But even then, location-based services was recognized as a field. And things have moved on considerably since those early days. We kind of, I think, divide the world of location-based services um, and the different types of application into four with two major groupings. So on the one hand, we uh, kind of consider there to be what we call proximity solutions. This is about nearness. Am I near something? Am, am I in range of something, typically? That breaks down into item finding, and there are products on the market today that help you find your keys when you've lost them. So tags you attach to luggage and keys and things, and if you've lost them, you fire up a smartphone application, and it helps you find the lost object. I'll say more about that later on. Um, point of interest information. This is you walk into a store, it tells you there's a special offer on tennis equipment because the retailer's loyalty application knows you like tennis. 
or you walk into a museum, into the first room, and it tells you about the exhibits in the room. These are examples of proximity, um, point of interest, information solutions. Then the other grouping we call positioning systems, and that's RTLS, that's the term the industry uses. It's things like asset tracking, okay, watching things move around. It might be assets in an office, it might be um, raw materials and parts as they move through a kind of manufacturing process. Um, and indoor positioning, which is about indoor navigation, it's indoor mapping, no GPS, we're in a large complex building. So these are the kind of four major um, ideas for location-based services that we recognise. Now we already have some things in this field um, prior to 5.1 and here they are on the screen. So we have a couple of Bluetooth profiles. There's the proximity profile which is to do with keeping things near to you, making sure that they don't go away too far, kind of determining how far away they are and so on. Um, the find me profile which is the classic profile for I've lost my keys, where are they? I press a button, it makes a beeping sound, ah, they're over there, that kind of thing. Over on the other side, we have the indoor positioning profile. It's only a few years old, not sure how well used that one is, but it's going to be well used soon because it relates to the direction finding capability I'm coming on to. But in the middle, I think the thing that steals the headlines all the time is uh, the Bluetooth beacon, which interestingly, ironically, I don't know, is not something from the Bluetooth special interest group. It's an application of one capability of Bluetooth en low energy, which is the broadcast or advertising capability that it has. Now, forgive, I'm probably gonna ask you all sorts of dumb questions to find out who you are as we proceed. Can you raise your hand if you, if you know what a Bluetooth beacon is? I'm thinking most of you probably, but it isn't all of you. Okay, so I suspected as much. Bluetooth beacons are really simple devices. So Bluetooth low energy has this ability to broadcast if you broadcast a special message format with a unique ID for each beacon, then an application typically in a smartphone can look up that ID in a database and conclude, I know where you are. You're in this place or you're near this object. It's a really simple idea. It's not enormously accurate for pinpointing where things or people are, but it has been very successful. Um, there's something like 130 million beacons in the world today. And I read a forecast, I think it was for 2021, that there'd be about 500 million beacons shipped in that year alone. So big acceleration of the use of beacons. They're being embedded in all sorts of products. I've seen them embedded in power sockets or the plugs, one of the two, no, the sockets. Um, I've talked to manufacturers of power tools, drills and things, embedding beacon technology in those so you don't lose them. So it's quite a big area. Bluetooth has quietly become very successful and key in the world of location. However, and I have a nice picture of an art gallery here, state-of-the-art technology, by which I largely mean beacons, gives us this kind of view of the world. It's a little bit approximate. You certainly don't know what direction things are in unless you get very clever with multiple beacons and techniques like trilateration and cross-referencing and things like that. It's a fairly um, coarse view of location. And there are requirements where you need it to be like that. It's much more of a pinpoint, almost, kind of description of the world in terms of objects it contains and their location. Same for things like asset tracking. Yes, you can see broadly where in a kind of production line process objects might be, but there are requirements that really do need greater accuracy to be possible. So Bluetooth direction finding is driven by like, those kinds of requirements. And once again, it's not the Bluetooth special interest group that thought that this was a good idea, although we did. It's our membership who really pushed this, saw potential for it in all sorts of industry sectors. So 5.1 has some changes that allow products and solutions that leverage direction finding to be created. And direction finding is about determining the angle or direction that a Bluetooth signal is being transmitted from. Now, this idea goes back 100 years or thereabouts, okay? Radio communications goes back to the 1890s. Still find that hard to believe, but it's true. Um, so in the very early days, there were experiments often driven by, driven by you know, wartime conflicts and things like this to determine the direction signals were coming from by measuring the signal strength with a directional antenna, oh, it seems to be strongest in this direction, it's coming from over there. But later on, around actually the Second World War, 
techniques got a lot more scientific and something called radio phase differences were used and they yield much better results. So the fundamental ideas in Bluetooth direction finding have been around for a long time, but they've never been brought to the world of Bluetooth and all that that entails. There are two methods, two architectures almost that are possible, and Bluetooth 5.1 supports both of them. In each case, transmitter and receiver, one of them has an antenna array, multiple antenna in it, antennae, one of those words. And the other one has a single antenna. The first method is called angle of arrival, and it's the receiver that has multiple antenna in it. Okay? The other one is called angle of departure. You probably guessed that, and things are reversed. It's the transmitting device that has the antenna array in it. So if we start with angle of arrival, it's the transmitter that's transmitting a special direction finding signal. Now, in more technical terms, there are some some new packets that have been defined for the link layer, those of you that know your Bluetooth stack. And you can use this, you can use either of the two methods, either in connections or in a connectionless mode. If you're using it in a connectionless mode, there's some special raw data attached to the end of existing packet types that can be used to derive direction information from. If you're in a connection, we define some new packets that also adds this special data to the end of the packets. It's this special data that turns these packets into direction-finding signals. It actually has a name. I'm not just going to keep calling it special data. It's called the constant tone extension. And it's basically a series of digital ones, okay, <coughs> which are used to determine the angle the signal's coming from in a way which will become completely clear to you, perhaps, at the end of this talk, or maybe not. It's a really difficult thing to, to explain. Who here knows what IQ sampling is? Oh, OK, only a few of you. Right, OK. So we'll, we'll take this slowly then and from the bottom up. Angle of departure then, as described, so I'll be brief here. Same kind of ideas driving the whole process, but this time it's the transmitter that has the antenna array in it. And, and which of these two approaches or architectures you use will depend on the use case. So we anticipate, and I think I had this at the bottom of my slide, um, Angle of arrival being used for the kind of asset tracking RTLS use cases for item finding and for proximity point of interest applications. Uh, but for things like indoor positioning, which is wayfinding, indoor navigation, that sort of thing, it's the uh, transmitting design device probably mounted on the ceiling. It's like a generation two beacon that will have the antenna array. And you'll be walking around with your standard smartphone being given very accurate information about where you are and where you need to go to to get to the gate so you don't miss your flight, that kind of thing. One of the major advantages, well, the major advantage of using this new capability versus beacons is this, and I may have another slide on this, I can't remember now. Um, if you consider beacons, today's generation one beacons, all they tell you is that you are in range of that beacon. So I could be anywhere, if the beacon was in the middle of the room, I could be in any part of the room. Think of a circle. All the beacon tells me is that I'm somewhere in that circle. I can estimate my distance from the beacon using signal strength based calculations, but it's not very accurate. Okay? So I get a rough idea of where I am, this kind of a circular band. I'm somewhere in that band. With direction finding, I can build solutions important you understand this, that will more or less pinpoint me to within around 10 centimetres. Now, this is not a made-up number. I know some people do that, I don't do that. One of the good things about this technology in Bluetooth 5.1 is it's been around for a while. There are companies who already have direction-finding products using a proprietary implementation using Bluetooth, but using exactly the same methods. We've standardized it. Those companies were involved in the standardization process. So there's already experience in the field about how well this can work with some knowledge, an understanding of where best to place your indoor beacons, um, what density, what height above the ground, what impacts a building's construction can have, and so on. There's some knowledge beyond the raw technology you need to get the best results. But 10 centimeter accuracy is pretty impressive. I think there are some demonstrations on YouTube Pretty sure I saw something there. One of the ways you can increase accuracy, um, you can use multiple beacons and 
use trilateration to kind of cross-reference the signals and their direction, figure things out in that way. But you can also measure multiple angles from a single signal if you have the right kind of antenna array. Simple antenna arrays allow you to measure one angle. Two-dimensional antenna arrays allow you to measure multiple angles. So very commonly what happens, that's quite a hard to read slide I've got there, I'll fix that, um, is that you measure the angle relative to a horizontal plane, that's called the azimuth. So imagine my, my beacon is on the ceiling there, it's that big light, so I can measure the angle relative to a horizontal plane, but also relative to a vertical plane. So I kind of get two lines emanating from that beacon. Where they cross, that's where I am or where my, my asset that I'm tracking is. So that's how you can get very accurate from um, a single device. But you need to do some design, okay? There is no magic, never forget that. It's very sad, but it's true. So here's the um, million euro question. How does it work? In some ways it's quite simple, but you have to go back to physics to understand how it works. And um, having spent some time explaining to, to colleagues with like a hundred slides and diagrams and scratching my head and trying to think how to say it, I thought I'll try and summarise in two sentences. So I did, and I have no idea if it helps at all. I'll kind of go on to look under the hood in a moment. Um, I'm just going to read it to you. Who knows what, what phase is in a radio wave? Again, know your audience. Only a small number of you. Okay, well, I'll explain. So small differences in distances between the antenna and array. So imagine I've got a row of antenna. Each one is a certain distance from the single antenna over there. Okay, and there will be differences I can detect in the distances between each of the antenna in the array and the remote antenna in the other device. And I can use those differences in distance to do some trigonometry. Who remembers maths from school? Yeah, cosines and sines. Ultimately, with the right raw material, measurements taken by the Bluetooth stack, I can use cosines and sines like we did at school to figure out my angle. That's the essence of how this works. So, given not everybody is uh, an RF radio frequency um, expert, um, and I'm hoping to keep you awake during this part, I really, really am, I'm going to keep watching. Um, <laughs> Let's just make sure we're comfortable with this and we, we, we know it's not magic, it's technology. There are some fundamental properties that radio waves have and sound waves and so on, all waves. One of them is the wavelength. All waves have a kind of repeating pattern. You can see I've got two kind of instances of that repeating pattern here on the screen. That, a single instance of that pattern is called a wave cycle. And the physical distance between the start and the end of that, because it's a physical thing traveling through space at the speed of light, that's called the wavelength. It's about 12 and a half centimetres for Bluetooth, depending on the frequency we're using, because we use different frequencies. If you imagine, and I will try and show you this rather than let you imagine this later on, that wave passing over an antenna, at a given point in time, where that wave intersects with the antenna, it's some way into a wave cycle, some proportion, some percentage. Well, we actually measure that as an angle that's called the phase, and it varies from zero to 360 degrees, or zero to two pi radians, if you prefer. So that's varying from naught to 360. Naught to 360 is each wave cycle passes over the antenna. And given its relationship with wavelength, here's we, where we get to figure out differences in distance and then do our trigonometry. Because if you imagine I have a centrally placed transmitter, it's transmitting a signal and actually in a spherical way, but we'll just keep it to two dimensions now. It's a circle, it ripples outwards like a stone thrown into some water. We get ripples. Where the ripple is, that outermost edge, that's the wave front. If we place receivers on the circumference of that circle, that expanding circle, they are exactly the same distance from the center. Therefore, if I measure the phase at a particular point in time, for both of those receivers, it will be the same, because phase is related to wavelength. I've got a certain number of waves added together away from that center at a given point in time. My antenna is inter intersecting the wave in a specific place within its wave cycle. Making sense? I do hope so. It's horribly hard to explain. So if I'm on the circumference of that circle, the distance has to be the same. The, the phase, therefore, will be the same. This is just logic. 
But if I arrange my antenna array so there are slightly different distances, because they're in a row, and effectively I've got a triangular relationship with the transmitter, I will detect different phase measurements from those two distinct antenna measured at the same time. And this is the raw material, the fundamental basis by which I can generate some numbers I can apply trigonometry to. And it looks like this. We don't need to go. This is copied and pasted from the specification. I should stress, though, we don't tell you the algorithm for calculating an angle. It will vary considerably depending on the design of antenna arrays. All we do in the Bluetooth stack is something called IQ sampling, which takes those measurements. We pass it up the stack. Ultimately, to the application layer, you have an array of two sets of numbers. You have to decide how to turn that into a direction. Okay? You'll also need as input information about the antenna array involved in either the local device, if that's angle of arrival, because you're in that device, you're doing the calculations of direction in the device which has the antenna array, or the remote device, you'll need to know what its antenna array looks like. We've, in a sense, not done the whole job yet, because knowing those things, how do I know what antenna array design is in that remote device in the airport that I've just walked into for the first time. How do I know that? You can't hard code it. Some profile work is being done, which will be released fairly shortly, which will tell you how to determine that. Some communication with the remote device, whereby its antenna design is informed to the device that has encountered it for the first time. So that's not done yet. For those of you into your Bluetooth stacks, Everything we've done so far affects the Bluetooth controller only. Something takes place in the um, Bluetooth controller and passes it up the stack through the host controller interface. Again, for those of you who know these things. And after that, right now, it's up to you. But we're going to give you some more standardized direction information on it. It's almost a joke there. Um, in the form of some profiles that we'll release later on. In fact, the indoor positioning profile is one of them. It's going to be updated to understand this stuff. And there's going to be another new profile that I can't name yet because I'm not allowed to. So, direction finding signals with this special data tacked onto the end is being transmitted to us. The Bluetooth controller is going to perform this thing called IQ sampling. And IQ sampling is measuring the phase of the wave as it passes over each antenna in some sequence, one at a time, according to some strict timing rules. Otherwise, their maths doesn't work. I and Q also give us the, the amplitude, the height of the wave. We don't care quite so much about that, but this is a standard thing that RF engineers do. This stuff's hard to explain. As I'm sure you're hearing, it's hard to visualize. So I did try and put together an animation, initially for my own purposes, so I could see this, because it's far easier to see. I have brought it with me. I don't know if I'll be able to get it to display on the screen here. Um, well, look, it might even work. So let me just show you what this looks like, because seeing is kind of believing, and possibly it's um, understanding as well. So that will. So what we have here, really slowed down, because normally this is the speed of light, is a radio signal, series of waves passing over an antenna. That's the white thing. And you can see the phase measured at the antenna is varying. It's going up and down from 0 to 360 degrees as we pass through the wave cycle. I introduce other antenna, I've got three in my array here, by clicking in the right place. Because I've been careful about the distance between the antenna in my array, at a particular moment in time, you can see that the phase is different. If I'd spaced them an exact multiple of the wavelength, it would have been the same. So that would have been a bad antenna design, it won't help me because I need these differences to drive the calculations. But that's what's going on. Sampling happens at intervals. If I switch that on, it happens at intervals. And what you'll see is I sample from one antenna, then another antenna, then another, and then I repeat. Some sequence which is implementation specific and not prescribed by us. So there's my first sample, 242. There's my second sample. There's my second sample, my third sample. Second, first, second, and second. There you go. Um, so that's what's going on in the Bluetooth stack, provided the stack has been told to do that. So again, for you that know 
your stack, the host controller interface has new commands that let you configure the IQ sampling behavior, switch it on, switch it off, for both connection-oriented and connectionless scenarios. But we're basically grabbing very fast, we're talking microseconds here, a series of measurements from waves passing over our antenna array, one antenna at a time. That collection of data gets passed up the stack, then it's over to you. Okay. I was quite pleased with that animation. <laughs> so that's direction finding. That's all I'm going to go into today. Let's talk about it later on if that's piqued your interest. Um, I think I've got five minutes left, so uh, can I take questions? Yeah. I'm really bad at timekeeping, so... <laughs> So that's that one. Let's talk about this next feature then. So there were four in total. The major one was direction finding. Let's, let's say we've had our first conversation about that, but we can talk one-on-one. -on -one. So um, who knows what GAT is? Some of you. Right, so Bluetooth Flow Energy consists architecturally of a controller and a host part, major kind of architectural components. The controller has the radio and other stuff in it, They're very low-level things. The host goes on top of the controller, and there can be different things in there. Bluetooth mesh, the entire Bluetooth mesh stack is the host part sitting on top of a Bluetooth low energy controller. But usually for connected devices, your activity trackers, things like that, we have a stack that comprises in the host part a number of things, including something called GAT. And GAT allows devices to expose a kind of structural or structured description of themselves. Okay? That, that kind of indicates capabilities, offers data that remote devices can interact with and so on. So that's called GAT. It stands for the Generic Attribute Profile. So for one device called a client to interact with over a connection, a remote device called a server, it needs to know about that structure so it can talk to it appropriately. And typically what happens when two devices connect is the first thing that then happens is the client device says to the server, tell me about yourself, please. This is called service discovery. The way this structural description of the remote device is expressed is in terms of things called services, characteristics, and descriptors. It's, it's a hierarchical description. It's fairly simple in a way. But the client device needs to know this. It's like it's a database, OK? And the client has to know the database design to be able to talk to it properly. It's very logical. Prior to 5.1, there are two scenarios. Devices which have bonded, which means they've paired, you know about Bluetooth pairing, everyone's been through that, and the security keys that result have been stored for reuse. That's what bonded means. If the two devices have bonded, we only have to do service discovery once. And this is great, because service discovery takes time, and it takes power. And we're all about low energy and conserving power here, okay? When I say it takes time, I've, I've seen it take seconds. So for a user experience point of view, taking seconds is not necessarily what you want. And in fact, it might be unacceptable, depending on your product type. But with bonded or paired devices, you do it once. So you take your you know, product out the bag, you, you pair it, you do your first test. It's a bit slow. After that, it's not. Okay? But for unpaired devices, that wasn't the case. And there are plenty of scenarios where you walk up to a thing for the first time, the two devices have never encountered each other. So in the old days, before 5.1, service discovery has to happen. The best kind of use case to illustrate this, this issue, I guess, that I can think of is Bluetooth door locks. Imagine you're walking through your office. There are dozens of doors. They've all got locks. And every time you have to do service discovery before you can open the door and go through it, it kind of renders the idea not workable, OK? Or you have to pair your device with, it, with every door lock, and every other employee in the building has to do that. It does, doesn't work. So, and there was always also a problem in this, a race condition, where sometimes it, um, one aspect of it didn't work too well. Um, occasionally, occasionally, the... GAT table, the database design will change on devices. It doesn't happen a lot, but does on some. And there's a way in which the remote device can indicate to the client, even if it's cached its database design, its GAT table, hey, I've changed. That didn't always work too well. So in 5.1, things have changed. Now, any device can cache the attribute table of a remote device, so that user experience thing is solved. I now can walk up to a door in my office, and for the very first time, it's my first day in a new job, Service discovery takes place, but that's okay because the HR manager's talking to me. <laughs> okay, so I don't really notice. After that, 
I never have to do it again. And best of all, one of the consequences of the way this works, the client device is able to recognize devices that have the same structural design, the same database design. Different devices, but they're of the same type. So of course they have the same database design on them. So once I've done that caching, that service discovery thing, once for one of the locks in my building, I've done it for all of them. So the user experience problem's gone away and there's a big kind of energy saving because we only have to do this once. There we go, and I've just told you everything that's on that slide, I think, there you go. But you can look at it briefly and then I'll move on. Fantastic. So, this will be brief. This is, um, I suppose, less interesting. This one comes from, really from the world of, of Mesh. Mesh has driven this particular uh, change. Mesh is connectionless and leverages the advertising capability of um, Bluetooth Low Energy for communication purposes. So prior to 5.1, devices will advertise, transmit these broadcast packets according to a schedule, timing, okay? We call the occasion when advertising take, takes place an advertising event, and there are three fre frequencies typically involved. They're channels 37, 38, and 39, and the way it worked was, according to the advertising um, schedule, uh, a device would advertise on 37, then 38, then 39, in that order. Repeat, 37, 38, 39, repeat, repeat, repeat. All well and good. And there was some, a little bit of randomization in the timing as well to help prevent persistent collisions. Two devices advertising on the same channels at exactly the same schedule, their packets would collide all the time. So there's a bit of randomization in the timing there. But just to maximize scalability, reduce the probability of collisions still further, 5.1 allows, now allows you to randomize the, uh, the radio channels that you're using for advertising purposes. So now we've got 39, 37, 38, 38, 37, 39 shown here as examples. It can now be random. It sounds like a really minor thing. It sounds like an incredibly dull thing, I would imagine, for some of you, but it's all about optimizing use of the radio medium. Radio is a shared medium. It has a finite capacity. You need to be smart and efficient to get as much out of it as possible. Gartner reckon there'll be 500 connected devices in the average smart home by 2020, which is very soon. Most of those will be wireless. Uh, this will be one of the things that actually separates out the wireless technologies, especially in the world of mesh. There are lots of them now. Okay. Attention to detail meticulous attention to engineering issues, that's ultimately what will, I think, separates out the winners from the losers. It's just my opinion, though. So, one more thing. I think this is my last for this section, and we'll move on to Mesh. Um, so one of the things that was released in Bluetooth 5, I kind of just alluded to the fact that under normal circumstances, Bluetooth's advertising the sort of scheduling of advertising events has a little bit of randomness in there so we don't sit on the same, exactly the same time interval um, precisely because it might result in persistent collisions. So that's a good idea. However, there are times where you really do need your advertising to be taking place at precise deterministic intervals. Okay? And Bluetooth 5 allowed you to make that decision that that's what you needed. So something called uh, periodic advertising was introduced. It means that a device can advertise according to a very strict timetable, very strict, exactly to the microseconds or hundreds of microseconds um, precise, but also at relatively infrequent intervals, it advertises a special packet that reveals to other devices what that schedule is what the timing is, so they can then synchronize their scanning with the remote device that's advertising. Being able to start scanning only when you know you should expect a packet is a huge energy saving. Scanning is expensive. Anytime you switch the radio on, you're using power, okay? So it's an expensive operation. And if you don't know when quite to expect a packet, you have to have it on for quite a long time just in case. So scanning is an expensive operation and periodic advertising allows a synchronization without a connection to take place and very highly efficient scanning to occur. However, there's a setup cost. Those packets that have the information about how often periodic advertising is going to take place, they're actually transmitted fairly occasionally. 
So for that initial synchronization procedure where the listening device has to find out how often the transmitting device is going to transmit, probably has to scan for quite a long time until it gets that scanning, uh, that synchronized inf uh, synchronization information, which almost defeats the object. So we have this new capability now for some specialized use cases, quite possibly for next generation audio, I don't know, um, which allows one device which is maybe power rich, has more power available to it. Uh, I've got a smartphone there with a large battery in it to acquire the scanning periodic advertising synchronization data from the remote advertising device and pass it across a connection to the low power device. Connections are very efficient. Connections involve a kind of timing contract. The two devices know when to listen and when to transmit, so that's very power efficient. So it's a helper in the battle against consuming too much power. It's a really important fact, factor in the IoT. So if you want to know more, um, obviously go to bluetooth.com. That is our website. Write that down. Right, you've got that. Good. OK. The course specification is, of course, the Bible. That's the place to go. Um, I think we have a PDF, which is a summary of the stuff I just told you there. can't remember what it's called, but it's um, on the website there. And we have a paper, a much deeper paper on the direction finding capability, uh, which I wrote, for better or worse, um, which is in final review right now. I have an email I need to finish doing uh, this afternoon. Um, I think that'll be out in a week or two's time. So if you want to look much closer at that subject, I'm hoping that paper will provide you with, with what you need. Let me move on to um, mesh. Don't know what I changed there. Let's um, get rid of that. That's that one. So who here has already um, looked at Bluetooth Mesh, done some reading about Bluetooth Mesh? Anybody? A few of you. OK, you can have a little rest then. You can do your emails, do some online shopping or something. Um, so Mesh, yeah, it's what? 14 months old, 13 months old, something like that now. It was nearly three years in the making. Um, I want to talk you through the fundamentals. I suspect I'm going to have to skip a few slides because of time, but I'll get you started. That you already know, so three technologies. Mesh is about potentially large networks, tens of thousands of smart devices, all able to communicate with each other, many-to-many -many communication. In terms of its relationship with the other Bluetooth technologies, it's a networking capability, not a radio communications capability. And it uses Bluetooth Low Energy for the actual transmission and receipt of wireless data. Okay? So that's the relationship between the two. It's the Bluetooth Low Energy controller with a Bluetooth mesh stack on top of it. So let's kick off with some network level concepts. There are other mesh network technologies out there, and they have some things in common, and there are some differences that Bluetooth mesh brings to the, the kind of subject. One of the things they have in common is this. Usually in the world of radio communications, two devices have to be in range to be able to communicate. It's common sense, right? If they're not in range, how can they possibly talk to each other? With mesh networks, that's not the case because we're now at a kind of higher level abstraction. This is networking and it's all message oriented. So one device will, let's say, transmit a message, send a message to an address which usually identifies multiple devices. We have a group addressing scheme. So these are like sets of, of, of smart objects somewhere in the building. And messages will bounce across the network. They'll hop from device to device to device. It's called relaying. I'll tell you more about relaying later on. And the net effect of that is that you know, if I flick a switch on, on the wall over there, it transmits the please switch on message to some group address. Those devices that are directly in range will immediately receive the message and switch on. Others in the, the room next door, maybe, that are just out of range, will get relayed and they'll get, get switched on. Messages travel at approximately the speed of sound. Latency is quite low. Bluetooth Low Energy is a pretty low latency wireless technology. Performs quite well in that respect. So that's multi-hop. We've got three multis here, by the way. So memorize this for the, for the test we're having later. Multipaths. So multipaths is about reliability. So I was um, lucky enough to be in the room for two days for the very first meetings of the Bluetooth Mesh study group. Study groups look at requirements, not solutions. That's where it all starts. And there are two topics, three topics that dominated the conversation those first two days. One was security, which I'll come on to. Another one was lighting, 
commercial lighting turns out to be really complicated, you have no idea. The things I know about that now that I wish I didn't know. Um, and the last one was reliability. Wireless communication in places like buildings is hard. Lots of engineering challenges. Achieving high levels of reliability is hard if you set the bar um, sufficiently high for yourself. If you feed into your requirements process and ultimately the solution that materialises simple requirements like thermostats in the smart home, which is a small space, you'll make it work, but will it work in the more complex and demanding world of commercial buildings, big offices, hotels, airports? So the decision was made right at the start to focus on the harder problems, large buildings, complicated buildings, demanding requirements for Bluetooth mesh, and try to make sure that we met those requirements, safe in the knowledge that the easier requirements of the small domestic residential space would be easy to meet. So that was the mindset. There are a number of strategies in the way Bluetooth Mesh works that are concerned with reliability. I don't have time to cover them all, but I'll point you out some easy reading material if you want to know more. But one of them is multipath delivery of messages. And it works like this. We have some dotted lines on the screen there illustrating a kind of mesh network. Clearly, you can see there is more than one way to get from that point at the bottom of the screen to the one at the top. There are different paths available. Okay? So inherent in how Bluetooth Mesh works, thanks to the way the relaying system works, when a device sends a message, what actually happens, provided you do a little bit of thinking and design work up front, multiple copies of that same message will travel by different paths through the network to the destination. The first one that arrives will have the effect that's desired, Copies get ignored. If a path is broken, though, because a relay that was previously there has malfunctioned, or someone's put a, a massive concrete block somewhere that it wasn't there before for some reason, it's OK because you have multipath. Another copy will get there. It's just architectural redundancy. It's a tried and tested principle that architects use in all sorts of system designs. The last one is multicast. This is way more interesting than it appears. I'm going to tell you what it is in a moment, and you might think, oh, big deal. It actually has a profound effect on scalability. The whole system is designed around the assumption that almost all of the things we will ever want to do, the kind of operations we'll initiate in our mesh network, will involve one device communicating with multiple other devices. So the way the dressing scheme, the communication process works, a single message can control thousands of devices. This is about scalability in ways I may have time to talk about because we're basically getting a lot of work done, transforming the state of a great many smart objects in our building with a few bytes. And scalability is all about conserving and using very efficiently that radio spectrum. That's where scalability limits lie in wireless communication. So let me introduce you to some special roles that devices can have in the network. When a device is a member of a Bluetooth mesh network, I'll tell you more about what membership entails in a moment, we call it a node. So that's the term you'll find in the spec. What you won't find are special kind of black box networking devices. You know, like for Wi-Fi, you have routers and access points and um, range extenders, they're, they're network, networking equipment. You won't find that in the world of Bluetooth mesh. You'll find lights and switches and sensors and so on. But thanks to software and configuration capabilities, they can take on special network roles and play a special part in the network as well as being a light or a switch or a sensor or whatever. And four are defined. So the first is the relay. I've already mentioned that. Um, the relaying behavior simply involves repeating a message, so it hops across the network. So it's part of the uh, multi-hop capability, it's part of multi-path as well. Not all devices will be relays, not all devices should be relays, because every time you relay a message, you're repeating it, you're going to use some radio spectrum. So small mesh networks, small Bluetooth mesh networks, very easy to set up, very easy, not much thought required, they'll just work. Big ones, like any network, they need some thinking, a bit of design. And one of the things you'll do is you'll consider where to place your relays, how many to have. Okay? And I think um, something like 1 in 100 devices are probably going to be, or 1 in 50. It's going to vary according to the building design, but certainly not all of them. If you want to destroy the performance of your mesh network, you'll switch on the relay flag for every single mode in it. 
guaranteed it will not perform very well. So, second and third, two special node capabilities here on the screen. Um, divide the world of your mesh network into two halves. On the one hand, we have power-rich devices like lights. They're you know, powered by the, the main suppliers, we call it in, in, in the UK, don't know what you call it here. Um, and, and power poor devices, you know, they're battery powered, they're, I don't know, doing energy harvesting or something, they're embedded in walls, they're difficult to get to, um, we really need to take care of those devices. Sensors are probably a, a likely example. So, built into the Bluetooth mesh protocol stack <coughs> is a way in which power rich devices can find, and sorry, can be made available to low power devices and they can work together and share the load. So the way it works is this. Um, as you set up your mesh network, you'll do something called provisioning for each device. It's a security procedure I'll mention more later on, and configuration. And you'll say, hey, you're being buried in the wall. I need this battery to last for five years. You're a low power node. Okay? You'll designate it that during configuration. Things like your lights, you're going to say, you could be a friend. It's a real term. I'm not making this up. It's actually in the spec. We call these things friends. And the relationship between these two things is called friendship. Isn't that nice? Go home happy. Um, so part of the protocol stack allows low power nodes, in other words, nodes that have been told they are low power nodes, to reach out and discover friends that are in range. Okay, there's a protocol, a conversation that they can have. Once they've found each other, and here's a kind of um, made up example for you. Imagine I have, um, a temperature sensor whose job is to only report, send a message whenever the ambient temperature goes above a certain limit or below a certain limit. Most of the time, this sensor is silent. It's not using the radio. So at this point in my description, there is no power consumption problem because it probably only transmits a few bytes a year. Okay? In the middle of winter, it gets really cold and we get a message, or it gets really hot in the summer, we get a message. The problem, though, is that Mesh devices also have to be able to receive messages. There are system messages they must receive. Maybe I want to send messages to reconfigure those thresholds. So to receive messages without missing them, the radio has to be on in receive mode quite a lot, and that's eating power. So the way it works is this. Once friendship has been established, any messages addressed to my sensor actually get delivered to the friend. And the friend will store those messages, and once in a while, once every two days, if you like, you can choose this. The low power node wakes up, sends a special message to its friend and says, do you have any messages for me? And it says no or yes, here they are. Okay, they're just sharing the workload. So that's friendship. And the last one is called the proxy node. Um, did you know there are 10 million Bluetooth devices that ship every day? Did you know that? It's a big number, that's like 4 billion a year and that number is showing no signs of slowing down. It's still growing. So obviously, one of the other things discussed on days one and two of those first meetings actually was, well, what, what, what are we going to do about all those? What are, what's the opportunity? What should we do to try and accommodate those um, other Bluetooth low energy devices, the ones that use GAT and GAP, the other thing, that are out there in the real world? In particular, things like smartphones and tablets and actually web browsers. We sometimes forget people are part of these networks as well. IoT is not just about machine to machine, people are part of those systems as well. So the proxy node understands both the world of GAT, the Bluetooth low energy stack you'll find on your phone, which has APIs for Android and iOS and you name it, it's everywhere, okay? And this understands mesh, okay? So it can translate between the two and by switching on the proxy capability of a device in a room somewhere, you make it possible for someone with a smartphone application to hop onto the mesh network, Nice dashboard showing you the state of all of your building systems or your industrial systems. Take control of things and so on, all from a nice user interface. Pretty important. So developers can do things with Bluetooth Mesh now without needing to know much that's new. Don't need new APIs, that's for sure. There you go. So how do they talk to each other? Already mentioned it, this, it's message oriented. So this, there are actually three Mesh specifications. Uh, one of them is called the mesh model spec. I'll tell you what a model is later on. And in that spec, you'll find a list of message types, each with a unique opcode. Inside our nodes, we have things called um, state items. States, again, they have names. They are all defined in the specification. They tell you the condition. 
some aspect of your device is in. Changing a particular state to a new value will change the condition of that device. So the simplest example is on-off, okay? Lights will have something called the generic on-off state in them. And if I send a message, the generic on-off set message, I can change it to a zero or a one to switch it off or switch it on. Really simple idea. So lots of states are defined, lots of message types are defined, and that's how things talk to each other. Look, they came on. It's also based on publish subscribe. Who's heard of that? So publish subscribe is a kind of messaging um, paradigm. That's a good word, isn't it? A approach to messaging uh, that we didn't invent. It's very commonly used in message-oriented software. And the way it works is that something sending a message does not know anything about the devices that will receive it. Just sends to some address, does not know the identities of the devices that will act upon that message. The devices that are listening for messages, they don't know who's going to send them, and they don't care. They're just listening for messages with a, with a particular address. So these two halves of the equation are decoupled from each other. And the advantage is very clear. Bear in mind, by the way, that a hotel can have tens of thousands of lights. If I make a change, if I add another light to my hallway, I don't need to reconfigure the switch. The switch just keeps transmitting its on-off messages to hallway lights. That's the name of the group address. And because I've told the new light it's a, part, a member of that group, it will respond. Okay? And vice versa. So I can make changes and I don't need to go through a reconfiguration exercise. One of the other mesh networking technologies, I think, you make changes, something has to run overnight to rebuild tables and things. Ah, you don't want that. Okay? It might be okay in a smart home, definitely not okay in a serious uh, building or industrial context. So this is more um, getting into what Mesh looks like for developers. I have 20 minutes left. So nodes, logically, they have a breakdown, a structure, and when you're writing code, you will be concerned with this structure. So nodes are physical devices. They may have more than one addressable part. I'll show you a picture of an example later on. Those individually addressable or controllable parts are called elements, so this is terminology. Sitting inside each element are things called models, which I did just mention briefly, but I didn't explain. Think of models, and there's a whole specification, as I said, for all of the models we've defined so far. Models are essentially standardized software components. We don't provide the software, we provide the specification for those software components. And this is where, this is the heart of interoperability, okay? Models provide a device with a particular set of capabilities that can be exercised in the mesh network. So the ability to switch things on or off, that's the generic on-off server model. Or to be switched on or off, that's the generic on-off server model. The ability to switch something on or off, so you flick a switch, that's the generic on-off client model. Okay? Big list of these things, covering sensors, commercial lighting, generalized ideas. That's where the word generic came on. That can be applied to any product. Changing levels, changing colors, all sorts of stuff like this. Changing temperatures, you name it. Models define that. So as a product designer, one of the, your primary jobs is to decide what models you need to equip your product with to give it the mesh capabilities that you want it to have. Okay? But because mesh models are standardized components, different devices from different manufacturers will work together. They include the definition of states and message types and stuff like that. So there you go. I think I probably just told you um, everything that's on that slide. So I'll take the opportunity to drink. So models are really important. They're basically the top of the mesh stack. So we're up at the top now where kind of application level behaviours are defined. So there's an example. Um, I've got an LED lighting unit. It actually has three distinct separate LEDs. I want to control them independently, therefore I'm going to define each of those three um, LEDs in that unit to be an individual element. So it's one node, it has a single um, Bluetooth um, module in it, single antenna, but I can address through the messaging scheme and the way the protocols work individual parts of that product because they're separate elements. And you can see here how node composition is giving uh, my devices the capabilities that they have. Um, I've got generic on-off server because I want to be able to switch them on or off. Uh, but because these are lights, I've also got um, light lightness actual um, and some other things to do with brightness. I could have put HSL in there, which is color control and so on. 
assembling models is what essentially defines my device. Security, big subject, don't have time to spend long on it, so very briefly, let's talk about it like this. <clears throat> so I mentioned membership of networks. Um, there is such a thing as ad hoc networking out there where devices that have never met each other before can meet, say hello, become part of a network, do stuff, go away. Bluetooth mesh is not for ad hoc networking. I mention it because I get asked that quite a lot. It's closed, it's private, it's secure. Consequently, there's a procedure for securely adding a device to your network such that it becomes a member of the network. Oh, my device is falling apart here. That's exciting. Um, it's called provisioning. It's comparable to pairing, but it's not the same. Imagine if we had to pair every device with every other device in our many-to-many -many communication network of tens of thousands of devices. We'd be there forever, and we'd need lots of memory. So pair, uh, provisioning is a one-off process. You take the product out of the box, you use a smartphone application from one of the manufacturers, you equip the new device with a series of security keys. One of them in, in particular is what makes it a member of your network. It's called provisioning. If I press this button, you'll see that process in action. There you go. So we take what we call a device. It's a raw device, not part of your network. We provision it. It becomes a node. We then also do some configuration. We configure um, addresses it will transmit messages to. This is publish and subscribe. Addresses it will listen for whether it's a relay or not, those sorts of things, all using the same application, typically. So security, here's a list. So I'm gonna really work my public speaking skills here to read a list to you, because we don't have time to dig into the detail. Key thing to know, though, in the world of standard Bluetooth low energy, security is optional. It's perfectly acceptable to have devices that have no security. We provide a toolbox of security capabilities that depend on being spare, uh, paired. We can encrypt the link, there's authentication, there's privacy capabilities to disguise addresses. All those things are there in the Bluetooth Low Energy specification, but as a product manufacturer, you have to decide what your requirements are. Uh, we don't know your business, we don't know your products, we don't know your use cases, so that's the principle. You have to figure out what you need to implement to meet your security requirements for your product not the case with Bluetooth mesh. Can't allow one product from one manufacturer with no or low security to weaken the security of the network as a whole. So security is mandatory. All messages are both encrypted and authenticated, so you can't fake messages and inject them into the, into the network. Um, I quite like this. We separate network layer security from application layer security, and what that means is this. Any message that gets transmitted has a number of fields in it. Some of them are concern, concerned with kind of networking stuff, addresses, things like that. Some of them were, are concerned with application layer concepts. Please switch the lights on. Please turn the heating down. But they're all in the same message. Meanwhile, in our network, we've got devices that want to do things like relaying. That, that's a networking operation. And to be able to function as a relay, those devices need access to the network level details in a given message. But why should a light be able to see the information about the heating system or the physical security system at the front of the, the office? It has no business knowing those things. So the two halves of the message are encrypted with different keys. So you have complete control over who can see what details. Uh, a light can be a relay for all sorts of messages. It doesn't need to and cannot decrypt the higher level parts of the message that are concerned with the application layer. Um, we can do things called area isolation. You can have subnets, any shape you like. You can have subnets inside. Other networks, think hotel. Here we are in a hotel now. We can cryptographically isolate each room from each other, almost like mini mesh networks, but they're part of the whole mesh ne network. You walk up to the front desk, you check in. They actually provision your phone using the hotel application. You walk into your room. You can control all the smart devices in your hotel room, but not the rooms next door because that, be, that would be bad, I'm told. Um, message obfuscation, we also disguise headed details. We've got an obfuscation process to make it very hard to track um, things that might move through a building, maybe people. Okay, that's a privacy issue, so we take care of that to the best of our abilities. And there's protection from some really commonly known um, security threats, things like uh, replay attacks, which I think is still 
to this day how many cars are stolen still. You know, you kind of hide behind a pillar in the car park, you record the remote control message that unlocks the car, and then the next day you come back, you replay it, the car unlocks, and you do some other stuff to steal it that I'm not familiar with, not being a car thief. So we have protection against that through some very long sequence numbers that can't repeat. Uh, trash can attacks, that's about extracting security keys from devices that have been discarded. We've kind of got a kind of key refresh procedure that will help you tackle problems like that. And device provisioning itself is secure. Um, leverages a lot, a lot of the stuff we do in pairing these days, elliptic curve cryptography. If provisioning itself was insecure, you could eavesdrop and steal the keys, then the entire thing would fall apart. So that itself is a secure process. So, very brief summary, a lot of attention being given to security for Bluetooth mesh. And look, there's some pictures of keys. Just so you know, there are kind of three types of key. Uh, I'm not going to labour this point. So network key defines the net possession of a network key means you're a member of that network and you can decrypt, encrypt network layer stuff. There will be one or more application keys that each device has, depending on the applications it's a member of. And in the context of a mesh network, an application might be lighting, heating, um, physical security, air conditioning. These are deemed applications. You get to decide when you're setting your network up. So possession of the right application keys makes you a part of that application and able to be part of that application's network functionality. And every device also has a unique device key. It's only used for one-to-one -one communication when configuring the device and some other stuff. So let me show you how some of these concepts come together in real products. So we'll look at lighting. Um, just as an example, Bluetooth Mesh is not just about lighting by any means, but it was one of the special areas that version one paid particular attention to. Consider this then, I've got three devices, I've got a switch, I've got a light or some lights, and I've got sensors of some sort. Let's say that's an ambient light sensor, it's measuring the light level in the room. As a mesh product designer, <clears throat> I'm going to equip these product types with certain Bluetooth mesh models to give them the capabilities I need them to have. I need to switch lights on and off, so they have the generic on-off server model in them. That's what contains the on-off state. I want my switches to be able to control switch on or off lights. So they have the generic on-off client model. Already mentioned this, this is the simplest possible example. My lights are nice, modern, sophisticated lights. I can control the brightness, I can dim and brighten them. They call it lightness in the world of commercial lighting. So we have the light lightness server. I can also control the color. HSL is hue, saturation and lightness. Um, so with that model in place, I have the ability to send messages that change the hue, saturation and lightness, in other words, the color um, and the brightness of lights, all through appropriate client devices. If you bring the sensor into play, the sensor has something called the sensor server model. It's very generalized. It will work with any type of sensor that I've ever heard of. Okay? It's very configurable as well. I've also added to the light um, itself the light LC server model. LC stands for lighting control. It's designed to work with sensors. So sensors can inform lights of environmental conditions and the lights can respond. There's another concept I've not mentioned yet, and it's called state binding. The specification defines relationships between different states, data items, potentially in different models. And it's a bit like a spreadsheet. Change the value of one state over here, and one or more others automatically get recalculated. So the relationships between these things starts to let you build some quite sophisticated behaviours. Imagine... Therefore, that my sensor, again, is an ambient light sensor, and my goal is to maintain a consistent ambient light level throughout the day. I want a nice office environment for people, nice, gentle light that's easy to work with. I also don't want to waste money, okay? It's not just about looking after my staff. I don't want to be burning the lights when there's fantastic sunshine streaming through the windows. So I really want to optimise the way my lights are used throughout the day. Self-optimizing behavior is the term that we use. So here's what, work, what happens. The sensor is sampling the ambient light level periodically. I don't know, every few seconds, every second, something like that. And it's publishing, that's the term, a sensor message. And because of the publish and subscribe me mechanism that I mentioned earlier on, 
those messages are responded to by the light LC server model in my lights. So they're hearing these measurements being taken by the ambient light sensor about the lightness in the room. And there are state bindings with things like the light lightness server, which is about brightness. So the way it works is this. If a cloud travels over the sun and it gets darker, because the sensor is saying, hey, it's getting dimmer in the room here, the light LC server model is being told about this, and it has this relationship with lightness, and it automatically causes the brightness to come up to compensate for the fact that we have less natural light coming in through the window. And conversely, if it suddenly gets very, very bright, the brightness will be turned right down to zero. The lights get turned off. So we're saving money, and as far as staff are concerned working in the, in, in the building, they have a fairly uniform, consistent uh, environment to work in. Example of how products get put together and how they work together. Yeah, I'm going to be out of time soon. Um, scalability is very scalable. Okay, a bit more. <laughs> no? You want more? Okay. You just have to believe me. So, some numbers first of all. Um, that's the maximum number of nodes you can have in your, actually elements you can have in your network. 32,767. Yes, it's one of those binary number things. Okay? It's to do with addressing. Um, Bear in mind, though, and I've said this once, so I'm going to repeat it, the multicast basis of the system makes this very, very powerful. A single message, very small number of bytes, can control very large numbers of devices all in one hit. And the reason this matters is because, again, it's all about the radio medium. Okay? If you are wasteful, if it takes lots of bytes to achieve a given result, I have to send 100 bytes just to turn one light on, Okay, I'm occupying a radio frequency for a certain length of time. If I'm sending 100 bytes with a really slow radio, bearing in mind that each bit is sent one at a time, I'm holding that radio frequency for a relatively long time. And during that time, no other device can use that frequency. This tends to shock people who don't work closely with technologies like Bluetooth, but all wireless communications are like this. It's kind of physics, right? You can't have two devices transmitting on the same frequency at the same time. It's like having a red light over there, which means something when it's on, a blue light over there, which means something when it's on. They both come in at the same time. What do we get? Some kind of purple color. What does that mean? I'm confused. They corrupt each other. Radio is exactly the same. So minimizing the probability of collisions is absolutely central to the engineering work that goes into building really scalable wireless communication systems like Bluetooth mesh. And to achieve that, you have the teeniest, tiniest, most highly compressed packets you can design that will you know, encapsulate the information needed by the remote devices. And you have the fastest radio you can find. So other mesh networking technologies whose names I will not mention because I will burst into flames, <laughs> possibly, have slow radios. And they're constrained by lower layers of the stack they do not own. I'm talking 250 kbits per second. Bluetooth mesh, you have at least one megabit per second to play with. If you're leveraging Bluetooth 5 capabilities, you can go twice as fast. You'll occupy that radio spectrum for a fraction of the time to get the same work done. And given the optimized nature of the packets, because this was thought of, remember in that first meeting, let's solve the big problems. Okay? A lot of attention went into this. A tiny amount of data transmitted very quickly. We're in the air for the shortest possible time. The probability of collisions is the lowest possible and consequently you can get more done. That's what scalability really means. It's not about megabytes per second, it's not a meaningful measure at all. It's about how much work can your mesh network support as it grows, as, as you add more devices to it. And I think I've just told you everything that's in all my other slides. I do this sometimes. Look, there's a picture of radio spectrum being shared. Uh, I've got five minutes left. Let's move. That's a slow radio. That's a fast radio. Those are tiny packets, do you like this? And, and actually we use multiple frequencies, but not really for scalable, scalability reasons, really for reliability. We're using three frequencies for every message, um, and that's not the case with other technologies as well. So, I've got time for a teeny demonstration. I don't know if it's worthwhile doing, actually, but I'm gonna show you anyway. And we can talk in breaks. So this is actually showing um, the proxy. I thought I'd show you this. It's kind of hard to show other stuff. Is this going to work? Is this working? Oh, here we go. OK, so really quickly, so I made a web application. I'm using the Web Bluetooth APIs, if you've ever heard of this. APIs web developers can use to interact with Bluetooth devices. 
I built that thing, so 64 microcontrollers kind of screwed to some Lego, because I'm a real engineer, me. Um, and you can see my user interface kind of reflects the um, physical layout. I've got another device there. It's actually a Nordic Semiconductors NRF51. Thank you very much. Acting as my proxy, Nordic, Nordic guys over there. And I'm discovering the proxy using my web Bluetooth application and connecting to it. And now I'm going to do things like switch on or off the whole panel or particular groups. This is the group addressing scheme being used. Top right there, you can see group addresses being changed by selecting different parts of my user interface. Um, and eventually something interesting might happen. You never know. I might skip forward in a moment. So I've got group addresses defined for basically every node in my network um, is part of, I think, three addresses. It's part of a panel group address, a row and a column. And there's a special system address for the whole network, which you should never use. So I'm going to use it here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I click a button, it sends a message to the um, proxy, which relays it as a mesh message, and hey, press so the lights come on. And then I think I start mucking around with switching them on or off, which is the same thing. Let's just whisk forward a bit. What else we got here? Oh, I'm playing with individual nodes there, very thrilling. Um, now I can change, change levels in lots of different ways. These are different message types I'm exercising here. I can set the level to an absolute level. With one message, I can say, be 50% bright, or something like that. There you go, so I've gone for a tiny amount of brightness there. I can turn it up to some absolute level. That's the generic level set message. Um, we've got deltas, so increments, decrements. Generic delta set is the name of the message type there, so I can go click, 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 and kind of Turn the, uh, the level up. You know, I might be doing this from a, a light switch on the wall, a dimmer. So that's direct mesh communication. This is showing the proxy uh, capability with a, a user interface for people. And whizzing forward, we've even got things called move operations, which are dynamic transitions, which I've kicked off there, and they're all changing in a dynamic way. There you go. Lots of information on our website. So if you want to know more, I'm going to make a recommendation. A yes, there are the specs. If you want to go there, first go there. By all means, they're um, relatively easy read. But we've got, um, where is it now? Uh, that one. So there's a paper called the Mesh Technology Overview. Um, it looks like it's 25 pages long, but it's actually probably only eight, but there are lots of pictures. The point here is that it's a fairly comprehensive review of what Bluetooth Mesh Technology is about, but you'll read it in half an hour. So I think that's the next thing to look at if you're interested in knowing more. And then you can either read the spec, or do I have a slide on this? Yeah, if you want to go hands-on at bluetooth.com, courtesy of the team I'm part of, and in fact, me specifically in this case, we've got what we call study guides. These are really self-study resources for developers where you can actually write code, go through a series of structured exercises, have things explained, really learn about the concepts. Um, there's one for Mesh. And there's one for the mesh proxy, which is a different interface, different protocol, show you how to make something like my web Bluetooth demonstrator there. So um, hopefully we have it covered from the theory of the spec to some of the practical work involved you know, in actual engineering. And I think we're all 37 seconds over time. That's just outrageous. Please forgive me. I think I'm done. Thank you.